Gumption. Defined as initiative, aggressiveness, resourcefulness, courage, spunk, guts, common sense, and shrewdness. <laughs> Welcome to the podcast. This is Stories of Gumption with your host, Ryan Lee. Let's rock and roll. All right, welcome everybody. This is Ryan Lee coming to you with another episode of Stories of Gumption. We're having conversations with entrepreneurs, creative thinkers, and just in my opinion, really, really impressive people. You know the drill. We have a couple sponsors that have been very loyal to us, and we want to give them some shout-outs, and we really appreciate that. The first one, Open Gate Farmstead. They are a stone's throw away from the mighty Osable River in uh, Open Gate Farmstead. is a first-generation farm specializing in free-range poultry, pasture-raised pork, and seasonal produce. The farm is run on a simple principle. Happy animals make the healthiest and tastiest product. Check them out on YouTube. They got a great uh, YouTube page that's telling the story of of the farm. It's not just about selling eggs and 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 meat and on all these different products that they have, which are phenomenal, by the way. But they're also telling a great story on their YouTube page, uh, Open Gate Farmstead. Again, check them out on Facebook, Instagram. Reach out to them on social media and try that farm fresh difference and follow their story. And again, as a special offer to Gumption listeners, they're taking a dollar off your first order of eggs. Thank you, Open Gate Farmstead. Uh, Our second sponsor is Kavanaugh Realty. Galen Trombley, Joey Trombley, that team at Kavanaugh Realty is crushing it. Uh, They are doing amazing things for our local economy. And I personally, my wife and I have had a phenomenal experience working with them. Uh, I've told the story before, uh, but... Galen Trombley worked with us when we were unsure, first-time home buyers, trying to figure it out, and he made it about us. It wasn't about him, and we really appreciated that. Uh, there certainly are a ton of great uh, real estate agents and brokers in this region, and, and the Adirondack region is blessed to have so many people working so hard in real estate to move the economy forward. But uh, Kavanaugh Realty, they've done a phenomenal job. There are local real estate company helping people buy and sell their homes check them out on the web or their social media hashtag local matters if you're interested in sponsoring the uh, the stories of gumption podcast uh, shoot me a message at stories of gumption podcast all one word at gmail.com send me a note i would love to have your sponsorship uh, it's a pretty affordable way to get your business or your message out there, and uh, we would really appreciate it. Today, I am with a very gumptious, uh, unique individual who I'm honored to sit down and have a conversation and share with you today. He's originally from Australia, which I love because... Those of you who know me uh, in a little more detail, I studied abroad in Australia for six months and uh, certainly love that country, and we'll talk about that. He's also uh, the Quality Assurance Manager currently at Norsk Titanium in Plattsburgh, New York. Incredible company, very cool stuff going on there. Uh, His wife is the Deputy Director at the Strand Theater as the Strand Center for the Arts in Plattsburgh. Also, lots of really good things happening there. He's got three boys. He's retired from the Australian Navy. He was an officer, and uh, pleased to have him here. Welcome to the podcast, Craig DeBoose. Thank you, Ryan. I really appreciate the invite. Um, when you give that, uh, that introduction and invitation, and, and it talks about creativity and entrepreneurial skills and innovative people, I... I'm quite flattered that I, I fit into that category, but uh, it's a it's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely, absolutely, and and I'm looking forward to this conversation because, of course, you're from Australia. That's, Indeed, yeah. Um, uh, in case the listeners haven't picked up on that already, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's it's one of those things about living in Plattsburgh. Uh, every time I open my mouth, people know that uh, that I come from somewhere different, um, and as much as I can. Somebody asks me where I'm from, and I say Plattsburgh. Uh, it, it creates a lot of confused looks. Yeah, yeah. Um, As when I was in Townsville, Queensland, mm-hmm. Australia, 
when I said, I'm from New York, first of all, they were like, of course. And then second of all, they were like, oh, New York City, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah, not quite right. Certainly, <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, certainly, Australians don't have the uh, the grasp of American geography significant enough to know that New York is in fact a state, right? As well as a, as well as a city, right? And and I've learned from that experience being in Australia that when I explain where I'm from to people who are not from this area, I say we are actually Montreal's uh, U.S. suburb. That much is true, but I feel like. Uh, <laughs> Whenever you get the Hollywood stereotypes, you right. get the impression of what a country is supposed to be. So there is a stereotype out there about Australia, just as there is about New York. Uh, and I feel like people who are tourists, uh, unless they really dig into it, don't understand the pockets of wonder that exist in countries um, beyond what you see on the television. Um, and Plattsburgh is certainly one of those. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So in uh, true stories of gumption, tradition here not every guest has been asked this question but most have and i'm curious okay because you're you're an interesting guy to me i love having philosophical conversations with you what is your definition of gumption so i i heard your previous podcasts and i'd heard this particular question asked and i sat and i thought about it uh, particularly (laughs) on the drive over here and I found myself finding lots of examples of gumption, but not necessarily tying it to a a specific philosophy. And what I came up with was this. Gumption to me is asking why. It's looking at something that is and asking why, or looking at something that isn't and asking why not. Mm. The ability to do that um, under all circumstances and in all situations uh, is something not a lot of people in this life do. So therefore, the people who can do that and the people who make those choices are the ones that I see as gumption. That's interesting. Yeah, but no, that's exactly that might be one of the best definitions I've heard uh, since starting this podcast. They're all good because they all. That's what's so great about the word gumption, right? Is like you can have these different definitions, and they're still all just as valid. But your uh, definition kind of ties into this this concept that like most people. They think of gumption and they're thinking of examples, but they're not thinking of what it means. It truly means to them. It's interesting. It's, it's just a different way of looking at it. There's so many things in life where you don't, you can't describe it, but you know it when you see it. Um, like duck eggs from Open Gate Farmstead. You're like, I know what that, no, that's a bad example. <laughs> that's a superb plug though. I like that one. Um, but you look at, you know, people talk about a, a camel as a horse built by committee. Um, you know, describe a camel, describe an elephant, um, describe the flavor of an orange. No, I, I, I can't describe the flavor of an orange, but I know it when I taste it. Yeah. So it, gumption to me is one of those things that it, it would almost be a lifetime experience and a lifetime occupation trying to nail down some sort of definition and some sort of philosophy surrounding what gumption is. But at the same time, I feel like that journey would take you to so many wonderful places uh, and, and be able to let you set up um, so much in your personal philosophy. If you actually just sat down and said, I'm going to come up with a definition for gumption that I think um, it, it's perfect for a podcast and it's perfect for the idea behind a podcast because it does set you down that path of exploration and that journey that goes with it. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the most compelling things about the way you described it initially when talking about on and on your podcast. Yeah. That's why I loved it. So yeah, gumption, great word, great philosophy, just everything encapsulated into one word. I love it. Well, I, I give myself an out with that last line, you know, really, really impressive people, you know, it's like, Hey, all right. If they don't fit into the first two, I find a way to make them fit into the last one. <laughs> Cause I think they're impressive. I certainly think you're impressive. Thank so you. I want to understand how you became who you are today. Let's start a little bit with your childhood. And, and we don't have to take too much of this because there's so much I want to talk to you about. Mm-hmm. But give me a background on, on what it was like to be Craig as a kid. So I, I was born in Australia uh, on a country town in a country town on a sheep farm. Uh, my father is a wool research scientist um, and has worked in that for all of his career. Um, but at the same time, he also owned a small farm where he ran a lot of sheep. Um, my mother was uh, a concert violinist, a school teacher, a social worker, um, had done a lot of amazing things with their life, um, and had always found a new direction, um, 
to take wherever she happened to be in the world. So they met in England in the 60s when my father was over there doing his PhD. Nice. And she traveled all the way back to Australia to, after they got married to live with him. Um, there was me, my sister, who was 15 months older. And then 10 years later, my brother came along. Um, so there was the five of us growing up in Australia, but at the same time through dad's work, we also traveled and moved a lot. Mm. So we lived in England for several years. We lived in Germany for several years. Uh, they lived in Italy while I was in military academy, uh, for a long time. Um, so while it was always coming back to the same place, we were citizens of the world. We were nomads. And that's, uh, that's proof at the moment, given how spread we are at the moment. So I'm in the U S my brother and sister in Australia. My parents live in China nine months a year. Um, wow. So we're nomads. We, we, yeah. we move around the world and, and treat life accordingly. Now, six weeks out of high school when I was 17, uh, I joined the military. And I guess that had come from, I'd been looking for something, an extracurricular activity and joined uh, junior ROTC. Uh, wow. And my local unit happened to be Navy. And that's where the interest in the military flowered. And joined the Navy as uh, an aircraft engineer, uh, an aircraft specialist. Um, and spent the next... Um, Length of time in my career, uh, working through various uh, paths, like uh, I was uh, working in maintenance management at a squadron. Um, I did structural integrity management for a fleet of helicopters. Uh, I did acquisitions and projects, looking at requirements and verification and validation and those kinds of activities. Um, and ultimately, I, I'd gotten to the end of, of that particular job in my, uh, in my Navy career, and my wife was interested in coming back to the US where her family was from. Um, and at that point we made the decision that I'm an engineer. Uh, I like the smell of jet fuel in the morning, I like <laughs> making things and building things and, and examining yeah. things. Um, and I was looking for a new opportunity. Um, so we moved to Plattsburgh to near her family who lived down in Peru. Yep. And by pure chance, I was offered a job, a really amazing job as the quality assurance manager at Platco down on white street who make uh, industrial valves. Yep. Uh, and working for an amazing guy called Doug Crozier. And, and a group of very talented individuals down there, um, a company that's been around for 120 years and has the history and the, and the process associated with that. So being able to be a part of that and seeing civilian life, um, but at the same time, having an opportunity to influence a company was very compelling. So I ended up uh, spending four and a half years with Patco, um, at which point the opportunity came up with NOSC to do something similar uh, in an aerospace mm. startup. So we make 3D printed titanium aircraft parts for the aircraft industry and, and other industries uh, using our proprietary process and machines to do that. Um, so again, being an uh, being uh, having an opportunity to get in at the ground floor of a company like that and having an opportunity to influence the direction, uh, the culture and the process that, um, that becomes NORSC um, is an opportunity I couldn't pass up. So here I am. And um, they sent still, you to Norway yet? They have. I spent uh, a couple of weeks over in Norway in uh, Honefoss, just outside of Oslo. Uh, at our parent uh, facility uh, where they do all of the research and development activities, uh, meeting my counterpart and, and the entire team over there. Again, an incredibly talented, driven, dedicated group of individuals. Um, because we're a small company, because we're a small, uh, a small startup and we're trying to disrupt the existing industry, uh, it takes a, a very dedicated mindset to do that. Um, but I am fortunate in that I have an amazing boss um, and an incredibly talented team around me um, and, and it's, it's a wonderful thing to be a part of. Dude, you're, you're living the dream now. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I can remember uh, when the first announcement, you know, for anyone living in northern New York, but particularly Plattsburgh or Clinton County, uh, when we heard Norsk Titanium was coming to town, it was like, whoa, game changer. I mean, there's there's tons of great employees or employers in in, in this area mm -hmm. uh, but and there's sort of this cluster of transportation manufacturing and interconnectivity between a handful of these companies and to see norsk coming that was that was getting a lot of buzz and a lot of excitement so congratulations for finding your way there that's a it's, it's that's been a, a big opportunity experience. i've been there for about a year now um great things happening so i'm really yeah. enjoying it so you know there's this interesting tidbit i want to i want to kind of go into here but like because you you gave the the elevator pitch version of craig but i'm going to dig into it a little bit more here because you talked about your time in the navy uh you talked about your wife that wasn't that was an interesting story i'm sure and um yeah i want to go into some of this but like you and i were talking before the podcast 
about the original theme that I thought of for this podcast, stories of risk, Mm -hmm. and how my wife was like, that sounds sad. (laughs) (laughs) That sounds awful. Nobody likes the word risk. But I said the word risk, and you almost like perked up. You were like, ooh, that's my... That's my word. That's what I focus. My whole life is based on measuring and assessing risk. Absolutely. Yeah. So the start of my career, uh, I joined the Australian Navy. And not only did I join the Navy, but I joined the fleet air arm. So we were operating helicopters off the back of ships, the proverbial dark and stormy night. And that became uh, a study in risk simply because it's a dangerous job. You do the job long enough and people die. And unfortunately, I've lost friends along the way um, through various reasons, including aircraft accidents, um, where you start to understand that inherently involved in that business is a level of risk that we simply accept by putting on the uniform and going and doing what we do. You don't think too much about it day to day. But I did notice when I first started, um, you can't say we're going to avoid all risk because then you never go flying. So the question then becomes, you still have to maintain capability. You still have to be able to do the mission Mm. or meet the purpose or or meet the ultimate objective. Now, in doing that, you have to set up a set of processes and systems that control the risk and control what you do and control how you do it so that you can drive the risk to an acceptable level. And when I start talking about acceptable risk, again, that's different to everybody. So again, you have to be able to create a process that everybody understands the risk in the same language. Mm, yeah. Now, pulling all sorts of disparate siloed people across multiple organizations into a conversation where you can have the same conversation in the same language, often those become conversations about risk and how we deal with that and how we're going to process that. Now, if you think about all of the, the multiple systems that go into your life and your business, all of the different things that you have to do and the procedures you have to follow, Everything is about risk ultimately, whether it's a business risk, gaining or making money, or whether it's a safety risk exactly, or or anything. Now, everybody's appetite for risk is different. And I will have nothing but respect for those entrepreneurs who go out and put themselves out in the world and say, I'm literally risking everything I own in order to be able to take a step forward. Um, That will never cease to amaze me, the the ability to make that decision. Um, But at the same time, the study of that, and how you quantify that, how you understand that, and how you put that in terms that everybody can understand from the CEO all the way on down to the, you know, the operator who's running your machine so that everybody's driving in the same direction. Mm -hmm. Everybody's pushing towards the same objectives and the same goals and being able to flow that through in, you know, in a language in such a way. So much of that comes back to risk. Mm. Risk is something people understand and people intuitively understand. So, All of my career and all of the early part of my career became a personal study in assurance, risk assurance, risk management, risk acceptance, and how we could um, understand all of our processes in such a way so that we could work out what was important and what wasn't, what you could cut away. Because ultimately in every part of your life, and I don't care what it is, everything becomes important and you will reach a point where you no longer have the resources just to deal with the important stuff. So that, may, that means you, you automatically drop into um, brush fire fighting mode. Mm-hmm. All you're doing is fighting the nearest fire or the squeakiest wheel or something like that. Yep. And being able to then work out what's truly important and cut away and prioritize those things that don't really matter but seem on the surface like important and being able to understand that in an objective way that lets you say, I can, I can drop this away. I can cut this away because this, is impo- this isn't important for this reason or this is another way that I can do it. That becomes the key conversation. Now you start with your own headspace and you start with your own little world. But if you can then widen the concept so that you can start dragging people along with you and having those same conversations in that same language, all of a sudden everybody's tugging in the right direction and things Mm. start to snowball. So when we talk about a conversation about risk, as the quality assurance manager at 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 a major company like that, every day for me is about risk in some form or another. Now, we might not talk about it in explicit terms like that, but that's ultimately what it comes down to. So when you, when you were in the Navy, Australian Navy, you're studying risk and you're, <clears throat> you're starting to build these experiences and these lessons. Was there ever a time where it just like clicked, like a story you can tell where like all of a sudden you're like, yep, this is what I, 
this is what I want to do. There was a problem or, or something that uh, triggered a, a moment for you? I've been fortunate in that I'd worked for a lot of amazing offices in my time and I'd managed to learn a lot. It all culminated in my very last job. Um, now, I'd been um, brought on to work as the lead aviation engineer on the purchase of two helicopter carriers for the Australian Navy. They were called the Canberra class, uh, Canberra class landing ships. They carry a lot of helicopters and a lot of landing equipment, and they're basically giant amphibious assault ships. Um, I was looking at all of the aviation systems, and my counterpart was looking at all of the avionics and communication and radar and software systems. Now, you can imagine in a $6 billion project, there's a lot of people involved and there's a lot of decisions to make. Yes, for sure. And we were doing all of the verification and validation testing that proved the systems could meet the capability that we wanted to. And this guy who was in his late 30s, he was a lieutenant commander, so he wasn't that comparatively high ranked, same as me. Um, And he was in a room sat on one side of a table facing politicians and senior officers and contractors and lawyers. And in front of that crowd, knowing that there were several hundred million dollars on the line, this guy stood up and said, no, we're not going to accept this. And I don't care if we have to trade off time or money or capability or anything else. But if we don't stand on this one, if we don't choose to say no and fix this now, then someone's going to die and it's going to, going to be my responsibility. And so in the wow. face of all of that, That's this, this, this guy stood there and pulled all of those systems together and all of the, the paths of risk that he'd worked out in his mind and all of the things that he'd yep. seen. And knowing that within, I think it was within two weeks, there was $120 million on the line for the, the major contractor, <laughs> has stood in front of that and said no. And looking at that and looking at his path to that decision, because I'd been, I'd been sitting right next to him in the, sure. in the six months leading up to this decision and seeing everything that had gone on. I had nothing but respect for that man in that moment to be able to make that call mm. and then do it in such a way that it wasn't emotional. It was purely objective. And he laid out the data and he laid out that decision. And in the face of a lot of people saying, oh, but can't we? He simply said, no, but here's how we're going to deal with it. Here's the solution I see going forward. So we dropped everything that we were doing and we spent six weeks focused on the problem and we got it done. But had we not, you were genuinely staring down the opportunity for some 20 year old pilot to get killed coming into the ship in 15 years time. Wow. And maybe he never heard about it. Maybe it never came back to him, but he had decided in that moment that this was his role and this was his principle and he was going to stand on it. That to me is, is as much the best example of gumption I've ever, ever personally witnessed. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm just glad I happened to be standing in the room at the time. Wow. That's crazy, Mm. man. That's a lot of pressure, but that, that's certainly an example of gumption because, and, and doing the right thing. And I can see how that would be such a, like a a life changing experience to sit there. You're working with this guy and you're like, what, what would I say if I was up there and you watch, you watch him down to him going, why? Why are we making this decision? Why are we choosing to do this thing right now and not stopping and saying it can be fixed? Yeah. Uh, and again, that, w- that was one of those moments where all of, the f- all of the philosophy and leading up to that moment had come to a head and mm. had, s- had just tied together in one perfect moment. And admittedly, it wasn't my moment. It was someone else's. Right. right. But being able to sit there and look at that and see the history and see the buildup, that to me sort of solidified my internal philosophy um, and gave me an opportunity to be able to, without having the pressure on me to turn a situation over, examine it and say, how would I have reacted? At what point in time were you in your, in your career with the Navy at this point? Were you early, mid, late, or I was a Lieutenant commander by this stage. So I was, was, that was my last job. So it's been three years in that role. And that was about probably 18 months to two years into that role. How many total years in the Australian Navy? So I did in total 19 years, including my academy time. And now you're retired. And now I'm retired. Now, what they say is um, normally in the US, you get a pension after 20 years. Um, so everybody stays 20 years if you get close. Yep. In Australia, they have the equivalent of a 401k. It's called superannuation. Yep. And when you first start, their match is nothing. But by the time you hit 20 years, their match is incredible. I think that, you know, they're giving you $2 for every one you put in or something like that. Oh, wow. So they, they really do take care of you. But it means that there's no hard and fast rule to when you have to retire. I simply chose to retire because I was coming to the end of this job. Uh, the next job that I was looking at was interesting enough, 
but wasn't really something that I wanted to follow in terms of my own personal development. Um, my wife was really keen to come back and spend some time in the States with her family. We still had young kids at that stage. Um, my two oldest were uh, five and six at that point. Um, and it was an opportune time where I felt like I needed to take the next step in my career. Mm. Um, I loved being in the Navy. Uh, I loved the people I met. I loved the work I got to do. Um, and I love what it taught me and the places it took me. Um, it was simply me saying, this is, this is the break point. Hmm. Um, not because I, I was sorry, not because I was breaking, yeah. but simply because I'm, I'm ready to make a break in my life and move on to the next chapter. Uh, and, and which this is part what we chose to do? Which part of Australia are you from originally? So I was born just outside of Melbourne. Okay, um, I lived in a place called Geelong, which oh. is a kind of a sleepy, hollow, second biggest town in in Australia, relatively speaking. Oh wow! Um, oh, sorry, second biggest town in Victoria, I should say. Yeah. Um, but I'd lived in Sydney. I'd lived in. Uh, I'd done time in Darwin. I'd my sister's up in Townsville. Um, so it, we'd sort of been all over. Um, oddly enough, my sister moving to Townsville, she's a, a trauma specialist and, yep. and is uh, a major part of the e- ER department at Townsville Hospital there where you went to school. That's it. James Cook University. And I always say this to people. I always say, you know, Sydney's amazing, but it's a city. And to a degree, cities are the same all over the world. Mm-hmm. The, the thing about Australia you will never experience anywhere else are... Uh, the flora and the fauna. So it's the Great Barrier Reef or it's the red center of Australia. It's the animals. It's the wide open spaces that look so completely different and alien to anywhere else in the world. So the opportunity, now you went to James Cook, right? Yeah. So the opportunity to spend some time in Queensland in that particular part of the world where you're caught in that belt between the Great Barrier Reef and the rainforest. Yep. That's an experience unlike any other. And I, I'm certain if people truly understood what your experience was, they would be very jealous. Oh my gosh. I, uh, I had some, some really awesome experiences in Australia. I remember walking to class in the morning and, uh, being with a, an Australian friend that I had met and developed. I was going to the same classes and we were walking and I'd be curious what your opinion is of this, but I was walking and we saw a couple wallabies just bouncing around. And for those who aren't aware of a, what a wallaby is, my understanding, it's a small, small kangaroo. Small kangaroo, exactly. And so these small kangaroos, wallabies, bouncing around. And, and I was like, those are so cool. I want to, oh, let's go see them. Like, and he was just like, dude, those things are pests. Like, I know some people who like shoot them because they're just like. They're a plague. They're, 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 they're a plague. They're, they're, a pa- they're a pain in the ass. And I'm like. Really, like to me, that is the cool, coolest thing ever. And it built this conversation about my home pests versus his home pests. And uh, he was so freaking fascinated by raccoons. <laughs> He's like, raccoons, oh man. What about raccoons? Like those would be so cool. And I said, raccoons are pests, okay? And uh, they get into your garbage. They do. All that. And he's like, oh, dude, that's what wallabies do. And I was like, oh, I, I feel like I'm finally getting a taste of what it's like to be a true Australian. You don't like the wallabies, even though my gut reaction is to love the wallabies. <laughs> <laughs> my, so my wife um, and I married in 2003, and she moved to Australia and, and lived there for uh, nine years, I think. Yeah, um, which I want to get into the story of how you guys met. Absolutely, but, but, but she, she, she had a lot of similar experiences um, in that... Um, trying to understand how Australians relate to each other or trying to understand, trying to understand that although we're a similar country and we speak the same language, there's a lot of difference. Um, And for her, it came down to the simple things. Like she went to the grocery store and was trying to explain to the grocery clerk that she wanted um, a bell pepper, but he didn't understand and kept taking it to the chilies. Um, And and eventually she had to call (laughs) me and say, what do you, what do you guys call these things? And I said, capsicum. Yeah. Um, and eventually, oh, he's, he's like took her straight over. But, but just the little subtle differences about the two countries. Oh, yeah. Um, and, and the vagaries. So, you know, the fact that Christmas was hot. So, you know, we went to the beach and had a, had a picnic on Christmas Day. It's like one of the hottest days of the year. Yeah, it's right in the middle of summer. Yeah. So um, it was always the subtle differences that she found most amusing and, and most infuriating about Australians. Um, she will tell you endless stories about the sheer amount of infuriating things Australians say. So what I was saying was that my wife um, has a never-ending 
I wouldn't call it love hate, but fascination with Australians and the way they interact. She laughs at the phrase "yeah no," and the way Australians use that. Um, and it was it was often confusing to begin with. Or she laughs at the way Australians always seem to end every sentence with an upward inflection. So she was never quite sure if they were asking a question or not. <laughs> <laughs> now, after nine years, um, she is the most Australian American I know and um, does an accent the likes of which um, I've never heard from a Hollywood actor. It's, it's really quite amazing to listen to her when she does it. And she can fool a lot of people quite comfortably. Um, but if you talk about stories of gumption, um, her lifelong dedication to nonprofits and to the nonprofit industry in general um, is one of those things that I always look at her with such uh, respect and admiration for. Um, she's worked in so many organizations where um, you're trying to create a cultural change on a shoestring budget um, which is a month-to-month proposition where you're never quite sure you're going to make payroll and you're never quite sure um, how you're going to make something work. Um, but the ability to keep asking why and keep coming back with the same answer is because you know the town needs it or because I can. Um, and her willingness to get in and get it done um, is always something that I found most impressive about her. Uh, but she loved Australia. Um, and, and as I said, she uh, she became very Australian over the time that she was there. Yeah. So. I mean, <clears throat> Australia, I could talk probably all day about, but since you're bringing up your wife and all the amazing thing that she's doing in Plattsburgh, and it, the listeners would be lost without knowing how you met. So tell the story. It seems you've told it to me before and it's, it seems so unique. You got to share it. So I was in the Australian Navy um, and... I, so a lot of, a lot of your conversations at that point, because you're out at sea and at different bases, but come online, their email or their back in the days of ICQ and IRC and all of those kinds of Oh yeah. Of my wife or girlfriend at the time, uh, we were together when I was in Australia for mm. like six months and Skype back then is not what it was now. Oh, a lot of frozen, frozen images and pixelated crap. And it, oh, it was bad. So... I would, I'd been talking online with a friend of mine um, yeah. and we got into a, an argument and I'm, I'm pretty sure it was an argument about a book or an argument about a philosophy that came out of a book or an interpretation of that. And about halfway through the conversation, he's like, you know what? I've got someone who can take, you know, who can, who can solve this argument for me. So he got her into the conversation. And all I remember about the first conversation, I'm pretty sure she called me a jerk three times in an hour. <laughs> um True love. Absolutely. I mean, it was, it was just love. It's a love at first sight at that point. Um, but you have to understand that she is uh, a staggeringly intelligent woman who um, approaches the world with, with an incredible openness, but at the same time refuses to take the bullshit that exists. Um, That's a perfect balance. And, and so is, uh, is, is somewhat difficult to keep up with sometimes simply because she of the way she approaches the world. But it's one of the reasons I love her the most. And it's mm. one of the reasons I enjoy being around her so much. Um, is because of the perspective that she gives to the world and that she gives to me as a result. So having had this conversation, we'd been talking online for probably a year, I guess. Now I'd planned a trip to the U S um, always wanted to see the U S always wanted to see the East coast. And a friend of mine planned to fly into New York and then fly out of Miami six weeks later, having worked our way down the East coast, New York city, New York, city. New York state. Absolutely. Yeah. I think we've established There's a that, little right? confusion there <laughs> sometimes. So, so having decided to do that, um, he broke his leg just before we were about to leave for the trip. I'm like, well, I paid all this money. I'm going anyway. So I'm thinking, who do I know that's, that's in New York city? And Karen had just moved back from San Francisco to New York city. She was living in Spanish Harlem at the time. And I called her up and said, Hey, I'm, I'm going to be in town. Don't know anybody. Can we get together? And she grabbed some coffee, grab dinner, something like that. So we, we get together on the first day that I'm in New York. And she asked me where I was staying. And I said, uh, I mentioned a hotel downtown. And she's like, that's ridiculous. It'll be too expensive. Come crash on my couch. I'm like, hey, that's great. So up into Spanish Harlem, um, crashed on our couch the first night and uh, never made it past New York after that. <laughs> um, so I spent six weeks enjoying New York with her and experience everything New York City had to offer. And then we did the long distance thing. So I was getting a lot of leave Um post deployments and things like that. And I was spending all of my time in New York. And after be, after having done that for a while and met her family and everything else, um, I decided that uh, I wanted to do this permanently. She was such a big part of my life and, and such had taken me so far in such a short amount of time. So I asked her to marry me and I asked her to move back to Australia. That's not a big ask at all. Or... No, which is probably why she didn't respond for a week. And, and that also probably didn't take any gumption on your part or 
maybe no. gumption on her <laughs> part, depending on what she said. I think it was all gumption on her part. Like I said, she didn't respond for a week, and then she came back, called me up, and said, "Yeah, right, let's do it." <laughs> for that week, you're like sweating it. Well, like, I, I thought I was done. I did you, was, did you drop some bank on a ring and everything at that point? And you're like, "Oh crap, what do I do?" I or? hadn't. Um, oh, I, I planned, smart planned play. Big, okay, I, I did the big pro- uh, proposition in front of her family in New York the next trip over. Okay, um, but this was this was a you know an interesting conversation. Um, but for her to be able to stand there and say, this is working and I'm going to put everything on the line and move with you to Australia. That's crazy. Like that's just out there. Uh, And again, one of those stories of gumption, the likes of which I am so incredibly lucky that she was willing to take a chance on me. Jeez, we got to get Karen Caboose on here. Yeah. And that we've been able to, to build a life as a result. Now we're, we're opposites in a lot of way. I am objective. I'm an engineer. She has a degree in art history. She's got a master's in uh, nonprofit management. Um, she's dedicated her life to the nonprofit sector. She worked for the Asian American Journalist Association. She's now the deputy director at the uh, the Strand Center for the Arts. Um, and again, has always dedicated her life to not necessarily the pursuit of business, but the pursuit of um, uh, more of the cultural aspects of life. Um, her involvement at the Strand and in the work they're doing down there, which is... Um, which is incredible. I mean, the, the, the classes they're developing and the education programs, the things they're bringing into the, uh, into the theater. Oh, for sure. Um, with, you know, a small team of, of incredible people who've managed to take the theater from what it was 10 years ago and have that restoration done and, and turn it into the, the cultural center that it is today. Um, that takes a hell of a lot of dedication. My wife and I uh, did Mud and Merlot recently. Mm-hmm. So we've done some a handful of paint and sips and you know, so they had do some paint fun and with sip. that. They do but mud the, and Merlot. The mud and Merlot was interesting because uh, I'd never really done like formal pottery training, but that was so cool. It's like that is a resource for this area now that's so valuable. It's so cool. It's like never had that 10 years ago, to my knowledge. At that level and that quality, I was just like, wow, this is, they just made this so easy. Yeah. For me, a guy who knows nothing about this, to buy a couple tickets, go down, and have a very personalized class. There was like six or eight of us in the class. Mm-hmm. And they're just like, yeah, it's capped. Like, we're having a great time. Drink drink a little wine, and we're going to make some pottery, and I'm going to show you how to do it. Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly what an arts center should be doing for its citizens. Um, That's awesome. Whether it's the music classes they offer, they you know, there's some life drawing classes. There's some uh, the theater theater camps and programs that they run in uh, in the summertime for the kids. Um, and, and God knows how hard it is to get kids off screens these days. So having those yeah. avenues for them yeah. to explore the things that they want to do in life. That's the kind of opportunity that the Strand is opening up. And, and again being able to be a, a fly on the wall to a lot of the things that are happening. So, you know, I, I volunteer there. I, I bartend occasionally. I, I help out with security or something like that. Ah, there you go. Um, again, it's it's a, an interesting window and a, a very unpressured window onto everything that's going on and, and the work that these people are doing. So, you know, Bob Garcia, the director there, um, and the entire team, um, really doing an amazing job at putting together something that I, that I truly believe is going to be so beneficial for Plattsburgh moving forward. Yeah. And like I said, I love this town. So oh, yeah, for anything sure. that, that benefits us has, has got to be good. Oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. And and I mean, from like uh, you know, my own personal uh, development and, and investment in this town, I mean, I, I've certainly uh, fallen in love with it from all these different organizations that I've been lucky to be a part of, from the Rotary to the Adirondack Young Professionals to the, all these different – and like to see the growth – and the momentum that Plattsburgh has had since I was a little kid. I grew up on Cumberland Head, mm-hmm. uh, you know, just be- almost like half Vermonter, you know, because Slope <laughs> Peninsula out in Lake Champlain. But, uh, well, yeah, like just to see the growth of the restaurants, the downtown, the, 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 the Strand Center for the Arts and all that opportunity, but also to see what the chamber has, has been able to leverage for in terms of resources, and then also to see the Norsk Titaniums and all these companies coming in and providing jobs, good-paying jobs. Uh, I feel like I was at Rotary this week, and Paul Grasso, recently mm-hmm. retired from the Development Corporation. For those listeners who aren't aware, the Development Corporation is a, is a real estate company essentially in Plattsburgh that rents and provides real estate 
um, economic development opportunities for large businesses, manufacturers to have space to open up U.S. operations. And um, he was touting, I forget the exact survey it was, but uh, recently Plattsburgh was ranked second in this very highly respected survey, international survey, as second as um, second micropolitan city or micropolitan area uh, in terms of development and opportunity uh, upcoming in North America and South America, mm. and number one in New York State. I have no doubt about that, uh, and no doubt simply because I see the development, and I know that having people who can network and have the willingness to bring the town forward makes my life easier when I'm trying to recruit people into the job. Oh, and yeah. You, you try, you're trying to sell somebody in a high-technology business to move to Plattsburgh. It becomes so much easier when you can point to all of these resources and this network to say, life will be great when you get here. So my wife and I were the same way. She was the business development director at the Cam- uh, Canberra Times, which is the major met- metropolitan newspaper in the capital city of Australia. We could have gone down that corporate path when she arrived. Yeah. She made the choice to feed back into this nonprofit avenue because she can be effective in that role um, far more than I probably could. Um, it's but a at the different same world, time, man. Yeah. At the same time, we've had the opportunity. And as a result, I mean, I love Plattsburgh and I love what it is. Um, so we're, um, we've really invested in the area and we've really come to love the area. We're raising our kids here now. It's a great place to live. It's, we've got a great school they're going to. So it means that we're so much more comfortable and, and now we're not looking. I mean, before we might've been looking to go to Connecticut or Seattle or Washington mm. or something like that. Now we've decided this is us. Plattsburgh this is, is home. Us, and this is home. Yeah. And it's cool when like the town is just big enough where, like there's tons of opportunity to meet new people and have new new things to do and new new opportunities in general. But the town is also just small enough where the degrees of separation are there. Absolutely. That, like it's it's like it's not it, too insular. Oh man, you can you can start building these these <laughs> these uh connections that you feel are going to uh make you feel like a stakeholder in the quote unquote company or uh, IPO of Plattsburgh. Absolutely. Right? Like, I feel like I'm an investor in Plattsburgh because it's the right size yes. where I can feel like I'm actually making an impact, but I'm not, the town's not small where I know everybody. Absolutely. Very yeah. much so. Yeah. So, okay. So we've taken some digressions. I, I, I certainly could talk about Australia more but the one thing i will say okay. is, is the place where ryan happened to live um in between the barrier reef and the, and the daintree rainforest should be on everybody's bucket list yes and, and whether yes. you're a true believer when it comes to climate change or not the barrier reef is undergoing some bleaching and some changes and a few other things like that put it on your bucket list take the 14 hour flight get your ass out there and see it because it is one of those natural wonders of the world and everybody should experience it once in their life so I'm going to, I since you went there, I'm going to say this, okay? While I was there, I had so many opportunities to go do some really cool shit, right? Like, just, there's just so much cool stuff to do that you can't just do here in Plattsburgh. Plattsburgh, Plattsburgh's great. But when you're in Queensland, northeastern uh, region of Australia, for those who aren't aware of the geography, but um, you're right there. Great Barrier Reef is right there, especially where I was with uh, Townsville. I um, I took a spring break. I don't know if it was technically spring break. So I went the, the July to fall semester. They're like offset yep. of, of the U.S. semesters. Mm-hmm. But anyhow, so I took our week off in the middle of the semester. I went to Magnetic Island. I know it well. It's a gorgeous Ye- spot. Oh, my God. Dude, you're walking around, and there's just, like, koalas sleeping in the trees. You're like, as an American, that's about the best freaking thing to see ever. <laughs> yeah. I learned a statistic uh, through some trivia game I was participating in recently that koalas sleep 20, on average, 20 out of 24 hours a day. Well, they can, uh, their, their digestive system is set up to eat eucalyptus leaves. Right. Eucalyptus is a narcotic. So they are literally <laughs> stoned all day long. All that's, day that's long. That's a koala. Yeah. I have a picture uh, on my Facebook page holding a koala. 
very touristy thing to oh, yeah. do, but but you got to do freaking it. awesome. Yeah. yeah, and a wombat. Yep. I'm holding a wombat. I've, I've hit one with my car before. Does that count? I, I'm pretty. So those who don't know what a wombat is, it's it's like. It's like it, an oversized guinea pig. That that's like the size of my dogs. It's bigger than my dogs. Of muscle. Yeah. They are solid, angry little creatures. And how the hell I, they gave me this one that was like, I guess it was probably stoned. It was probably tourist <laughs> drugged and it was a terrible thing. Now I, now I reflect <laughs> on it. But it, they put it right on my lap and I got a picture with the wombat. No, the, the way I like to think of it is they, but, they eat things and they go into the food coma and then they're a little bit nice. Okay. Just, so, just there's don't catch them so there's breakfast. wombats and then there's uh, um, wallabies, kangaroos, w- koalas, wallabies. They're all platypuses. They're all just freaking pests apparently um then there's all of the the ocean life like sharks and well seals so and- okay so the other piece that i wanted to share was was my experience on the great barrier reef and i with the privilege that i had of my parents helping me finance some of this uh i spent a lot of money on the great barrier reef i got patty certified mm-hmm. scuba cer- certified i spent a lot of time out there and i don't regret it one bit I do remember uh, scuba diving and just seeing like reef sharks, mm-hmm. like me to you away. Yep, they're cool as long as you're not bleeding. <laughs> well, we, we, but we, like, <laughs> no, we we it, it's one of the ongoing jokes in Australia that whenever you have uh, tourists coming from another country, you always tell a joke. You know, sharks aren't a problem. I mean, no one's been taken in at least a couple of months. <laughs> um, okay, here's a question for you. I'm putting you on the spot. Sure. And we're taking a big digression here, but this is important. Absolutely. Bring it on. When I was on Magnetic Island, yep. there were buoys probably like 500 yards out yep. from shore. Mm-hmm. And this local was telling me, he's like, yeah, they put bait on those to keep the bull sharks from coming into the beach where people are slim- swimming. Truth. Fuck. Um <laughs> They, so you, I thought he was totally just like messing with me because I was an Austria or an American, but I'm like, that's crazy. No, you, so there's well, bull sharks that are there that they're like, yeah, it's better to bait them and keep them full 500 yards from or whatever the distance was from shore rather than make them interested in coming in to shore where people might be swimming. Jaws has done an incredible disservice to sharks because everybody has this fear of the great white. Um, but the great white um, goes after seals, and, and the great white great white attacks along South Africa and Australia and places deeper like that. water. Yeah, but they're usually going after surfers who are dangling their feet off a surfboard, so they look like a seal in the twilight. And then when they so, bite them, they let go. Usually is what I'm told they because they're like that doesn't taste like a seal. I don't want that, and they let it go. Now a bull shark, on the other hand, is is what they call an estuary shark as well, which means it can it can cope with a certain amount of fresh water. So in places like the Brisbane River and those all of the all of the shark attacks that you hear about are usually bull sharks. And they're, they're aggressive, ferocious. nasty, take anything. You know, they're, they're really quite um, uh, like a bull. aggressive species. As yeah, you like would a bull. Anal- envision a bull um, shark, yeah. So and they'll go after anything if it looks like food. Um, but they like to hunt in the shallows where animals drift into the shallows and on the beaches. So when you know something small like a kid is is paddling in the beach a bull shark will aggressively attack it. So they're absolutely right. I mean, if you feed them and bait them offshore, they're not going to come inshore to go hunting because that's the only reason they're there. They're, they're there to hunt. So if you can, you know, Pavlov- get a Pavlovian response and keep them offshore, then you don't have a problem. I always thought I was that was a big, like, white lie that they were just telling some dumb American that would believe it. And it turns out, Australia is even more badass than I thought because they're baiting sharks off the shore now, to look, keep people safe. I know we're digressing here, but <laughs> you hear all of these horror stories about Australian wildlife. Um, so I grew up with spiders and and, sna- uh, and sharks and snakes. Um, but things you, you have to remember is, is snakes are very timid creatures. Mm-hmm. So they'll run when they hear you coming. Oh, for sure. And you, you've pretty much got to be doing something stupid in order to get bitten. Same thing with sharks. You've got to be swimming with a, 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 a bleeding fish in your belt or something before they'll come after you. Mm-hmm. Um, again, spiders, most people get bitten because, um, you know, you stick your hands in a woodpile without gloves on. So when I first, when I, when I went to the woodpile in Australia, I'd kick the woodpile over and then kick each log and then pick it up with gloves and make sure that I was, um, that's just what I grew up doing. 
and I'm petrified of spiders. Mm. I've seen too many of them. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas over here, nobody has that fear. So of course there's that natural sort of living fear. Um, but there, you know, it's one of those things, as long as you, as long as you understand that you're now in their environment and you treat that with respect, there's no problems. Yeah. So I know lots of people who accept the fact there's snakes living under the house, especially in Queensland, cause they're a little bit crazy. Um, but they keep the rat population down. So nobody minds the snakes. What's it's not, it's like the number two or three most poisonous snake that's in Australia. It's a, nine out of the top 10 most deadly snakes in the world are in Australia. I don't remember the name of the snake, but I was walking. Uh, King Brown. To, what was it? Which the is King it? Brown snake. King Brown. It wasn't a King Brown. No. But I was walking down the sidewalk to, from, from campus, uh, James Cook University, down to this little pub that was like on the river. It was a cool spot. We used to go there and do trivia and, and, and kind of hang out as friends and, uh, I was walking down the, the the sidewalk there and my buddy just turns around. I was not paying attention and he's like, stop, don't move, don't move. And I was like, what? And I turn to my right, just off the, the edge is this snake and he's like, it's a whatever the hell he said. And he's like, that's a number two. And I was like, what's a number two? <laughs> like, I'm going to crap myself or what? <laughs> He's like, no, it's the number two most poisonous snake. It, it was, he, I forget what the name of the snake was, but I didn't move. Mm -hmm. I swear I made eye contact with this snake. And then it just slithered away. Yeah. But at the time, as a dumb American, I was like, this is it. This is over. I'm over. This is me. Ryan Lee has come and gone to planet Earth. <laughs> <laughs> I was freaking out. <laughs> understandable. Completely but understandable. But that's because I was uneducated on how it really is. Yeah. There's too much crocodile dundee out there that... It's what you grow up with. Yeah, puts this false narrative out there. All right. We digressed. I'm sorry. We digressed. It's fun, though. So what I'd really like to focus on now for the rest of the podcast here is sort of this theme that we talked about beforehand of as it relates to quality assurance and, and sort of general business and decision-making in life, choices versus reasons. Now, okay, so this was a part of the philosophy. I, I joined Platco. It was my first civilian job, and I was very fortunate that I got to work for the CEO at there at the time, a guy called Doug Crozier. Yeah. Doug had a huge amount of experience in business, and, and anybody who knew or met Doug knows um, his knowledge-based philosophical approach to life and the impact that he had on the people around him. For sure. I met him a few times, an incredible individual. Indeed. Now, uh, unfortunately, uh, he passed away in March of last year, um, but I was, I was very fortunate in that I, that I got four years of what I'd call um, a, a postgraduate uh, postgradu education in Doug's philosophy. Yeah. Now, I remember having a, a particularly difficult couple of weeks, month, um, and we've been talking almost every day about the issues that we were facing and the problems that we were trying to deal with. And eventually he handed me this book uh, and this book was called the achievement habit. And there was a note on the front of it that said, uh, start with chapter two. So I turned to chapter two and the, uh, <laughs> and the title of the chapter was reasons of bullshit. And the philosophy behind that was that everything is a choice. Now, we could give you all of the reasons that we ended up in a certain situation. I could give you a reason I missed a deadline. I could give you a reason where, why I couldn't afford this on a certain day. But what it comes back to is choice. I chose not to prioritize my deadline over all of the other things that I had to get done. Um, I could give you reasons that I'm 40 pounds overweight. And what I'm coming back to is the idea that I've prioritized. I've made a choice to focus on work and my sons and their activities mm. and my wife and our relationship and all of those kinds of things. And when everything's important, but you don't have time to get everything because you've literally run out of resources, you have to make a choice. So you can call it reasons if you want. But when you understand that everything is a choice, all of a sudden that philosophy starts to open up. And you can start to say, all right, what data do I need to make that choice? How do I make those choices? How do I come to terms with the choices that I have to make and the decisions that I have to make about what's important? So you may choose that your business is going, going to be your focus mm -hmm. and the development of that business, but you can reevaluate those choices. 
I feel like so many people fall through life. Mm. They go to college because it's the thing to do. Right. They, they take a law degree because it's the thing to do. And maybe they wake up one day when they're 40 and they think, you know, I've been very successful, but I've, have I really truly understood why I've done all of this or have I just kept taking the next step because mm-hmm. it was there? Yeah. Um, and I'm a victim of that as much as anybody. We all probably are to, to a little bit of an extent, yeah. but in our own way. Yeah. So finding a philosophy that fits that and you can apply to anything. So whenever I'm at work and we start talking about um, the processes and the procedures and, and the quality assurance techniques that we have to apply to the business to make certain that the product coming out the door and going to Boeing or Airbus is what they want, you have to find a balance between the cost and the risk associated with it. And that's what quality assurance is. It's finding a balance between cost and risk. Mm. So in doing that, everything is about choice. Now, you can sit there dealing with all the quadrant one stuff, which is all of the really important, really urgent stuff. But that means the thing that gets lost most of all is the stuff that's really important, but it's not so urgent. The strategic thinking, the long-term planning, Mm. the, the objectives and the understanding, the flow down of the business goals so that everybody's pulling in the same direction. And instead of dealing with all of that, you deal with all of the really urgent stuff that's really not that important. You know, it's, it's responding to an email that doesn't really mean a lot of stuff or it's, it's getting into a discussion, which is fun, but it's not really driving you forward. Yeah. Yeah. Making those choices and being, being able to understand it in such a way that it draws everybody together and gets everybody headed in the same direction. That's the, that's the crux of everything we do in quality assurance and, and in a lot of what we do in life. So being able to generate that philosophy behind that, so much of what I did with Doug was about generating that philosophy, the why, you know, realizing that arithmetic is not an opinion, it's data. And the more you can support with data in such a way that the choice becomes obvious, that becomes the key to driving the business forward and and having, being able to influence up. Now, I'm incredibly uh, fortunate in that um, my boss, um, who is the the vice president of quality for uh, Norsk, came out of Pratt & Whitney, uh, an incredibly gifted businesswoman um, and a woman with an incredible philosophy on life. She she doesn't attach her ego to ideas. So although she's an incredibly principled and gifted woman, she has an incredible openness to opportunity and to ideas and thoughts and the potential for, for new processes to come in mm. and having someone who's willing to explore those ideas with you, to test those ideas with you, but just then let you off the leash to get them done. That that's a great has balance. taken everything that I took, uh, that I learned at Placo and has suddenly let me put my money where my mouth is, which is why I'm loving Norsk so much. But again, taking that, that philosophy, that reasons of bullshit philosophy behind everything that you do and everything that you are, I'm not perfect at it. I make a hell of a lot of mistakes. Sure. But being able to tie something back to that um, means that I've, I've become a lot more comfortable in myself. Mm. So I, I experienced anxiety and, and, you know, crippling social anxiety at times throughout my life um, just because I was never confident in who I was and, and what I was able to do. Getting to the point in life where you develop your own personal philosophy to the point where you can stand in the middle of that storm and say, this is stressful. Yeah. There's pressure. There's stress. There's everything going on, but I know my way through. I can yeah. find a way through. Yeah. And although reasons are bullshit, there, there were certain things that tied into that. So you talk to um, some of the incredible people I've met in Plattsburgh, Scott Brightwell, Paul D. Domenicus, uh, and they've got this philosophy that goes, it's only, and that's everything. So you sit there <laughs> and you go, you know, it's only 40 push push-ups." Um, it's only another six weeks. Yeah. You know, it's only two sleepless nights. It's only, you can get through anything as provided you can find a path forward and start putting one foot in front of the other. Yeah. So there's an incredible amount to that. And it's, it's, it's days worth of conversation, but being able to, to, to distill that down in such a way that it becomes that, that touchstone to your personal philosophy and lets you apply it to so many things means that all of a sudden you do have that core of self-confidence and you do have that willingness to believe that I can get through this. And maybe not everyone's going to agree with me. Maybe not everybody's going to like what I've got to say. Maybe we're going to get into some really tough, hard, nasty conversations over what has to go um, next or what has to happen now. But ultimately I can be confident in my own, 
in my own mind and my own principles that I can find a way forward through this. Mm. That must be really interesting too in a in a company that's pretty much a startup mm-hmm. versus we've got an established project product with an established system that's worked for decades and uh, we need you to just fine tune it. You're deep in the in the startup mode of Norsk, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, absolutely. And, and developing quality along the way seems like, I mean. Well, Norsk started out as a, an R&D uh, project with a bunch of PhDs back in Norway 10 years ago now. Mm. Um, the production aspects of it um, have only been a fairly recent, sort of three to four years ago, we started talking about that. I've only been with the company a year. Um, but again, as a startup in a high technology environment, we've been able to draw on people from UTC and General Dynamics and Pratt and Whitney, um, Baker Hughes, all of some of the the um, industry standard companies um, in America. Having the ability to draw those kinds of people to the area and have them be a part of the business in this place it's means huge. that it's huge. I, I never, you know, I, I walk into the room. I, I can pretty much guarantee you, any any room I walk into in there, I'm not going to be the smartest person in the room. But I know that I have a bunch of incredibly talented people around me who can bring their abilities to bear on any problem. So we, we a lot of our processes are collaborative, um, simply because we want to bring as many different thought processes to bear on on what we have to do. Having the ability to work with those kinds of people. Again, that makes it incredibly compelling. And, and I love that startup environment as a result. And I love the kind of people we're bringing to the area as a result. So um, I have a group of people that I, I enjoy getting up to go and work with in the mornings. That's uh, awesome. I enjoy being around and I enjoy the fact that I get to develop my own, own ideas and abilities around them because it makes me better at what I do. Mm. In the same way that um, being married to my wife makes me a better a better person. She's complimentary to me. She, she challenges me in ways that nobody else can having those kinds of people around you and, and being able to be a part of that. Um, that to me is what life has become and is what life is all about for me. And, and it's the thing that I enjoy most about who I am and what I do. Hmm. It's interesting to think about like, I mean, obviously you're working for Norsk, which is a, a very large and growing manufacturer 3d mm-hmm. printing manufacturer of airplane parts mm-hmm. um but you look you, you take that back on scale to my garage where i'm obviously not trying to make a huge business out of it but just sort of how does someone who's trying to start in my case a just a side for fun uh or maybe serious uh chair or furniture business or something else like on the side uh leverage uh quality versus quantity versus i don't know you know what i'm trying to where i'm going with this like yeah as a young entrepreneur or a, a startup that's if, if you're, super small if you're a young entrepreneur and if you're looking to take that risk to make a step in the world that says i'm going to do something a little bit different and i don't care what scale it is it's a book title it's a book i've talked about uh, at other times with other people, but start with why. Everybody knows the what and everybody knows the how. Mm. Not a lot of people think about the why. And what the why comes back to is, how are you going to be different? What's going to say to people, I'm coming to you instead of Amazon or the guy down the street or something like that? So when you're talking about something like um, something like a manufacturer, now you can, we get judged on quality we get judged on lead time and we get judged on price. So what are you going to focus on? Are you going to be better than the other guy? Are you going to be faster than the other guy? Or are you going to be cheaper than the other guy? Because they're the points of difference. And you can't necessarily have all three. No. So in in most cases, pick two. We used to talk about it when we were buying things for the Navy. You talk about capability, schedule, and, and cost. Pick two. Because that's all you get. And you're going to have to trade one off the other. No, no project usually comes in with the right capability on time and on budget. Yeah. So you're going to have to trade off. But when you're going out and you're asking people to make a decision to come to you and to, to buy what you have or be a part of what you're doing and to accept what you're giving them, what's your point of difference? What's the why of how you're going to do that? So if, if you go out and you're in business and you want to be a disruptor in the industry, you want to do something really different. 
that's fine. But how, pe- how are people going to view you and how are you going to highlight that difference and show what you can do? How are you going to create that value proposition for somebody that says, I value this over something else? Now, price is an easy, easy value proposition. I'm cheaper than the other guy. Mm-hmm. That's, an, that's an easy one. Yep. But if you can say, well, anybody else is 12 weeks, but I can have it to you in two days. In the, in the kind of environment we live in, that's incredibly compelling as well. But yeah. if, you, if you don't have lead time and you don't have quality, because everybody largely at the end of the day is producing the same thing, um, you know, a, a, a tire is a tire is a tire kind of thing. How do you create that, that difference in your mind? Now, I know you have your business creating Adirondack chairs. Now, you know, it might be that you produce uh, a chair that weathers beautifully and looks great and meet specific criteria. So that's your why. That's why people will keep coming back to you because they know you can deliver a quality product every right. time. Right. There's no variation. There's no cheap cheapness to it. It's handcrafted. It's personalized to the situation. They can build it to the, the size and the location that they want. It's personalized. That's very compelling for your business idea. But I always say when we're talking about um, business and entrepreneurship, and I don't care if you're a, you're a, a business that's been around forever or a business that um, doesn't exist, I mean, sorry, that, that's just starting up, find the why and find the value proposition, find the difference. Mm. So if you look at something like Blockbuster, it was um, a core to American society for what, for 10, a 15 long time. years? Yeah. Everybody went good there for VHS theft. Yeah. Everybody had their Blockbuster card, and then it disappeared because Netflix came along. Now, did they ever stop and think about the why? Hmm. You know, what, what they were delivering and what the environment was like and what their point of difference was. Probably not. So they just kept hoping that their ongoing business model would last them forever. And, and it, it kind of never does. So if you can start with why, and if you can start with the, the things that make you different and what that, what that says about your value proposition, and you can build that in such a way that it becomes objective so that Everybody who comes into your business, whether you hire people or whether you are telling people about your business, if you can couch that in such a way that it becomes the core philosophy for what you do, then you can get everybody driving in the same direction and you're going to be much more successful. Yeah. So to every entrepreneur entrepreneur out there, I say, make sure you understand the why and make sure you understand what makes you different. Well, yeah, because it's so easy to think about, okay, here's my raw material cost. Here's my margin. If I make X amount of this amount of time and this much labor, blah, blah, blah. Okay, I'm profitable. But that's not that's not it. That's not the whole picture. That's just the price focus. Yeah. And if you're choosing to focus on price, that's your model. Mm-hmm. But if you're choosing to focus on uh, delivery time or the, um, the other phrase you used, but um, that's a, you got to take a different model. Um that's where I'm weakest. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> I can't whip around a chair in the fastest delivery time. If anything, I'm definitely the slowest. You order a Rondack chair, it's not coming tomorrow. True. But I'm focusing on the quality. Yes. So people know that when they come to Rondack chairs, they get a customized chair built specifically for their purposes to the highest handcrafted quality. There is. At least to my ability. Yeah. And that's compelling. That's a value proposition. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, people aren't, people aren't going to come to you for the lead time. They're going to come for you, come to you for the final product when they get that. You want the lead time, you're going to Kinney's and you're buying a plastic chair, possibly for $18 or whatever. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And that's fine too. But, uh, but we always talk, I, I do a little bit of woodworking myself. Um, and I always said, said this about um, the, the time and effort that it takes me to build a piece of furniture, whether it's uh, a set of drawers or a bed or something like that for that same price in terms of cost of materials and tools and everything else, I can go and buy exactly the same looking thing from a Ashley's furniture or anything else. But the difference is instead of getting a veneered timber board, I get solid timber and I get it made to my specifications and my dimensions right. and everything else. Right. And with the character that goes with something that as a, um, a, a very amateur woodworker, um, I get to, I get to put into something. Yeah. Um, so the value proposition may not be exactly where you, see, you know, where you first thought you might see it, but guaranteed it's there. 
Um, and that's yeah. why people keep coming back to Rondack Jazz, right? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I told you before the podcast, I mean, for a while there, I was I was marketing it, not aggressively, but I was consistently marketing it and doing a pretty good job of keeping the brand out there. I donated a chair to the local chamber and it became an actual business. Like it became, you need to like, take more time than just the weekend or after work to to accomplish all these and and that's where i've i've kind of dialed it back and people probably haven't heard from it in a little while but um i'm with you man i think when you can produce something that you took your time on but you're just super happy with it and it's to your specs and it's what you wanted the whole time when you first envisioned it that's the beauty of woodworking Mm-hmm. Uh, when you first came over, you you mentioned you uh, make guitars. You got into a little bit of guitar making, and uh, and guitar making is one of those things that they have kit guitars online nowadays, or you can literally start with a piece of mahogany and, and work from scratch. And you find that there's an incredible amount of really high quality wood in this area, in terms of things like snake maple and, uh, and some of the ashes and things like that. So having been able to download the plans for a, uh, a Stratocaster or a, a Gibson Les Paul or something like that, a Flying V, a bass guitar, it, it gives you the opportunity um, to, to build something like that. Now, I had to dial it right back because when I left Australia, I had to sell all my tools and my woodworking equipment. Um, that's a whole different story and, and one which... Oh, we'll, so so that, this is something you started in Australia. Yeah, this is something I started years ago and... Uh, and to be honest, um, telling the story of how I had to sell my tools will probably have me in the fetal position crying in a corner. Okay, we won't go there. Um, so let's not go there. Um, but uh, there's something very zen about it. Um, very, For sure. Um, so I'm slowly building back up to it now um, and, and being able to sort of personalize those things and hang them on the wall. Now, I, I'm, I love music. My mother was a concert violinist and, and I was brought up in a house that was constantly filled with music. Um, so I, I play a little guitar, I play a little piano, I play the cello right through school. Um, so music has always been around me, but I'm, I'm not a, a gifted player by any stretch of the imagination. Um, my brother-in-law is a, is a superb guitar player. Mm. Um, I, I dabble and I, I just in, I do it for the love of it rather than because I'm any good at it. That's the right reason. Though. Um, but again, it, it's, it's finding those opportunities to explore the things that make uh, that are a little bit different about me. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, it's it's things like that. For my wife, it's art and history and, and a few other things. Uh, for my kids, uh, they love dance. So they break dance and do musical theater and a bunch of other stuff. Um, but again, it's it's the, those those things that aren't necessarily work, although I do love work. Uh, it's it's the things that are compelling outside work and it's, it's the things that uh, draw me back every time. I love it. Dude, I think we're getting close to the rapid fire zone. Rapid fire zone. Right, are you ready for the rapid <laughs> Bring fire? Bring it qu- on. <laughs> yes, let's do that. I, I love the rapid fire. Stories of gumption, rapid fire. Here we go. I feel so like I'm here- facing the firing squad. This is terrible. <laughs> well, if you've listened to any of the episodes, which I think you have. You I told have. Me, yeah, okay. So you probably you probably know the questions. But- All right, my, no, shout out for anybody who's uh, who's listening Bill Owens podcast. Listen to it now. Amazing. <laughs> Thanks. I wish I had two more hours with Bill Owens. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Congressman Bill Owens, uh, the episode just before this one, episode 12. So uh, get on yeah. it, people. Yeah. Uh, tough act to follow. Very, very. You're, you're doing a good job, though. Thank you. Okay. Question number one. Hit me. What's a book? And you've already referenced a couple books in this episode. But what is a book that you would gift to a friend and why? Two books. The first I would give to a friend if they had any interest in business philosophy is The Achievement Habit. Simply because it's got so many nuggets of, um, uh, of business philosophy and wonder to me in that book. Uh, again, that was passed on to me by Doug Crozier. Um, and one I've recommended to a multitude of friends. Love it. As a fiction book. Uh, and particularly for anybody who is um, uh, come out of the military or is interested in going into the military, uh, a book called Gates of Fire by Stephen Pressfield. 
And that What's that about? It's a story about the uh, 300 Spartans who held back the Persian army at the gates of Thermopylae. And Love it's it. A, uh, it's a historical fiction book. But again, it's one of those uh, stories of leadership and pressure and life philosophy that, that is wended into that book. Mm. And I understand it's now on the reading list at Annapolis, the Naval College here in the mm. US. Interesting. Highly recommend that book to anybody. Love it. Question number two. What's a piece of advice that you would share with your 18-year-old self? Stop worrying about what other people think. Oh, my God. That's the... All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go somewhere with this. You ready? Mm-hmm. So since the episode with Maria Latinville, there's been tons of people saying, uh, Ryan, I want your story of gumption. And I don't want to do it because it sounds self-serving. But you said, uh, stop worrying about what people think of you. My story of gumption has been recorded. My wife goes through the full intro of, you know, this is uh, some stories with entrepreneurs and creative thinkers and really, really impressive people. She does the whole thing. She hosts the show. And uh, she interviews me, and that's part of my stories at Gumption. So we'll see when and if I release that. But uh, soon, I hope. Y- yeah, uh, that's a real thing, man. Okay, so we're on episode thirteen right now. That's a real thing. Uh, being not not that my stories at Gumption is a real thing. I'm saying people caring about what others think of them is a real thing. That's a phobia for a lot of people, and I yeah. think it affects a lot of people. Very much. That is the uh, impetus, I guess, of, of my whole gumption story. We as humans want to connect, right? We want to connect with friends and the people we love and colleagues and everything else. And particularly through school, you get this idea that that means being liked. Um, and again, it's, it's studying great leaders or people I've known or something like that. Uh, I always look at a guy called General Peter Cosgrove who became the governor governor general of Australia. Um, he was a guy who was almost kicked out of the Royal Military College as a, as a young officer cadet. Oh, uh, wow. And eventually took his career to incredible heights. Um, and the ones I admire the most are the ones who could have quite happily sat back and gone with the flow, but they're always the ones who stood up and said, fuck it and did it anyway. Um, Amen. I spent so much of my life worrying about what other people might think um, and and losing sleep over it, uh, worrying whether I said the right thing or did the right thing or dressed the right way or acted the right way. And so much of that comes down to you waste a lot of time worrying about it. And in it's the end, you so should just true. drive forward and do it. Dude, that's the best answer that I could have given my 18-year-old self to. Um that's not what my answer was in the pre-recorded. <laughs> yeah, there's a little teaser. There's a little. We'll, we'll okay. see how many people are actually listening through the full episode because I'm not going to say anything. But we'll see how many people will be like, "Hey, I heard you say you have something recorded, and Lauren hosted the podcast. What's right, here's, up with that?" Here's my challenge to you. Okay, we're on episode 13 right now, right? Yeah, I want to see it before episode 21. Why 21? Because it's seven more from now. <laughs> okay. 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 Well, uh, I have a handful of great guests lined up and, uh, we'll see where it fits in, but, um, it's ready to go. Okay. It's been, it's been sitting in the computer. The MP, MP3 file exists. And, uh, if for no other reason, I, I guess I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm a little nervous to release it because I don't want it to as- appear. No, no, you, p- you picked the right time. Game of Thrones is ending. People are looking yeah. for something to do. <laughs> yeah, Here you yeah. go. Ryan Lee's podcast. Ah, crap. That's what I wanted to ask you about <laughs> was that HBO show Chernobyl. Chernobyl, yes. Eh, we'll get to it another time. Fair enough. Okay, so there's a little Easter egg for everybody. But uh, it all was it all came from, from Craig. It's Craig's fault that we got an Easter egg. I'll take the blame. It's all good. It's all good. Uh Question number three. It's the longest rapid fire yet. Uh, If you could have a billboard anywhere in the world or multiple billboards, I don't care. But if you could put up a billboard 
with anything on it, what would that billboard say or have an image of or what would it be? And why? That's a fascinating question. A billboard anywhere in the world without wanting to get political. Um, and there's always a danger in that. The thing that I look to most is the parliamentary systems of the world, be it Congress in the US or Parliament in Australia or Parliament in the UK. I wish I had a way to get the message across. I don't care what side of politics you're on, but will you guys just start the conversation and try and get something done? Mm. So if I had to stick up a billboard, it would probably be outside one of those buildings and it would probably be in in 60-foot high letters saying, do your fucking jobs. (laughs) That's that's where my head's going at the moment. You know, and and, I, and like I said, I, I don't care if you're a Democrat or a Republican, a, a socialist. A, I don't care what you are. Yeah, I think that's that's an idea at the moment. We can all get our get our arms around. I think you're absolutely spot on. And in recent years, I've actually felt that uh, it would be healthy to eliminate the party system in America. And not to go too political here at the, <laughs> the, the, the 11th hour, but I just feel like maybe if you were electing somebody based on what they actually said they were going to do and they're po- like, who yeah. cares? But I, I understand listen, there needs to be a system to in place. Podcast, but yeah. If you listen to what Bill Owens said and he said the process of campaigning and getting elected is a very awkward one. Um, and a very difficult one and a very challenging one. There's not a lot of people willing to do that. All right. So you're not necessarily going to get somebody who leaves um, a job in research or a job as a doctor or a job as something else like that to take on public service in that way. Yeah. Um, and I think that's that's a very difficult part of it. Now, this is a, a conversation that would take hours and many, many more beers in order for us to, <laughs> to get through it. And again, I think the philosophy surrounding that uh, is irrespective of whether you're what side of politics you're on but we seem to have reached something of an impasse. Mm. So my point is we have to find a way to get through this. Yep. What's the next step? So why don't we leave that one there? I'll have you, I'll have you on for, for, uh, you know, an- another episode. Definitely. And, uh, but but well, like I said, that is an entire another episode. <laughs> <believe me. laughs> this is, I, I hope you thought about this one because this is the classic board of directors question. The stories of gumption mm-hmm. board of directors question that, Everybody gets asked uh, if we could create a three-person board of directors for your life to guide and mentor you through the rest of your life. They may be alive, deceased, famous or not. Mm -hmm. Who would those three people be and why? I thought about this question and I thought I had an answer to it, but it turns out I don't. Um, I have an incredible family, an incredible network of people around me, both my direct family and the family that I married into. Uh, I wish that extended family could be my board of directors, but that would be a, a horribly cliched answer. And I don't want to leave you with that one. So but I, it does say a lot about, about you and your values and the life you've built for yourself. So congratulations for that. But yes. So uh, if you start talking about people, um, general Peter Cosgrove, uh, a guy who led the, um, the Australian commitment to East Timor uh, back in the late nineties, Um, Again, a guy with a fascinating philosophy of life uh, and a fascinating uh, way forward. Um, Doug Crozier, who was my mentor at Platco. Um, As I said, he has uh, since passed on. But a guy who um, was proud of me when I disagreed with him um, and took great delight in the fact that I did, um, Mm. which meant that I learned so much more than I might have uh, under someone who just talked at me. Mm. and finally, you know, you could add that third spot with, with anybody from, you know, Stephen Colbert to Aaron Sorkin to Clive James to, to any of those people who have um, that comedic approach to uh, life's philosophy. I'd love somebody who had that insight into life and the ability to, um, you know, uh, what's the guy's name? Um, uh, the British guy who worked with uh, the, the Late Show. And I can't think of his name, but, but anyway, those people who have the ability to distill an incredibly complex and difficult subject, put a funny spin on it. James Corden? Could be James Corden, oh. but it's not. It's um, last week tonight with... Oh, okay. Well, The I British digress. guy. 
The um, British guy, of course. Either way, the, those people, who, somebody who has that ability, and, and I'm looking for a, a skill set here, not necessarily a person, but a skill set to be able to say, I can take a complex subject, distill it down, make it funny, and make people hear it. Mm. Having somebody who can do that for me, I wish I had that person sitting on my shoulder every day. I agree. I agree. <laughs> I agree. Uh, and, and I think for me, the, uh, the big takeaway from that answer that you gave is that uh, don't take your tel- don't take yourself too seriously all the time. Hell you know? yeah! Uh, I think people take themselves a little too serious sometimes, and I think it's it's healthy to just see the comedic nature in your own imperfections and your own and the, just the natural comedy in in life that exists that is often too serious. You know, I think that, that that could be a whole nother topic and a whole nother podcast. <laughs> we got um, like four episodes no, no, teed the, up now. <laughs> but the idea that you can sit there and, you know, I'm going to throw out an idea in the world fully expecting that somebody wants to slap me down. Um, but that's the fun of it. You know, let's let's have that conversation. Let's let's thrash out that argument. Let's let's find out a way that we can actually find some common ground or agree to disagree, but at least have the conversation. Mm. But let's do it in a way that, you know, I'm not going to call you an idiot. I'm just going to have a conversation and, and I don't take it emotionally or personally or anything else and, and don't treat it that way. Um, uh, I, I think somehow the, the art of conversation is, is somehow being lost with the, the advent of social media and the internet. Yep. Um, and if I don't have an answer for you, I just, uh, I just sometimes think that you're right. We take ourselves too seriously yeah. and we read too much into things and we, mm-hmm. we dwell on things when asking a simple question would have resolved it for us in minutes. So why not ask the question? Back to the, the theme earlier in the podcast. Ask Start why. With why. <laughs> Start with why. That might be the, the, the title of this episode. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, let's do that. Um, well, that's assuming people like last this long into the podcast because <laughs> we've, we've gone down a lot of rabbit holes here. It's true. It's true. But this has been a very enjoyable conversation, Craig. I've really enjoyed it. Uh, I hold you in very high regard. Uh, I ask people to come on this podcast that I hold in high regard and... It was very easy to ask you to come on this I appreciate podcast. that a lot. And, yeah. and like I said, I, um, it's, it's been incredible to listen to the conversations that you've had. Um, you've had an incredibly diverse range of people get on the show uh, and, and talk about their experience and their ideas. And I think there's always, so, there's always something I can learn from everything, every podcast that you've had. Um, so as I said, I appreciate it. It's been great. Yeah, absolutely, man. Uh, a legend currently and a legend in the making. <laughs> that's you uh anyhow we're gonna <laughs> he's looking at me like uh i don't know if that's the, the send-off i wanted but hey well i i, I will leave you with this yeah um g- there's a memorial to doug crozier outside of Placo, and it says uh love laugh and leave a, le- leave a legacy i don't know as i'll be a legend but if i can leave something of a legacy i'll be a happy man amen I, amen i like that a lot uh, big thanks to Craig Debus and uh, our two sponsors. Uh, we have uh, a sponsor from Open Gate Farmstead. Remember, happy animals make the healthiest and tastiest product. They are selling all sorts of meat, vegetable, and eggs uh, products from their farm. It's it's great. We, uh, our family buys uh, the eggs, uh, occasionally the duck eggs. And uh, we have had the pork as well. It's really good. But I think also more importantly, check out their YouTube page because it's also about the story that they're telling. And I think that's important. Uh, our other sponsor, Kavanaugh Realty. Big shout out to Kavanaugh Realty. They're doing great things uh, in this community. And we really appreciate that. We'd also be remiss and probably not mentioning that Craig was on the Galen Trombley show. I don't remember which episode, but man, you were you're this is not your first podcast. You were on the Kavanaugh Realty channel, man, with Indeed Galen Trombley. Um and for those of you who haven't uh, heard that part of the podcast, look for the one with me and Paul D Dominicus. Look for the moment where Galen Trombley tries Vegemite for the first time. I promise you won't regret it. It's live. It's on the podcast. It's live and, and on the podcast. And I've had Vegemite, and it, uh, admittedly, I think it's the worst thing I've ever tried, ever. Like, it's bad. Uh, I'm, I'm not surprised to hear you say that, but... <laughs> um, Australians oh, like it. Everybody else in the world doesn't. It's yeah, fine. pretty much. All I can say is, I warned him. He did it anyway. The consequences are his alone. <laughs> So little little cross pollination there of podcasting here. Uh, 
Kavanaugh Realty really love what they're doing uh, as a real estate uh, entity in this uh, community. But also the Galen Trombley show. Craig was on there. Great episodes. And uh, thanks for tuning in. Here we are. An hour and a half in. Thanks for sticking around, everybody. Until next time, this is Stories of Gumption. And I'm Ryan Lee. Take care.